proud to be here tonight, and I'm proud to see how many people showed up. Showed up, and I really guess an award like this uh, leaves someone like me speechless, which doesn't happen very often to those people who know me. <laughs> but it highlights, I think, what is all good about science and what we're doing here. So I think there's a few things I want to emphasize here today, which is just how. Um, Easy it is to win a Nobel Prize, <laughs> with a little hard work, um, take a little bit of risk taking, and, and really uh, a balanced life with some luck. So a Nobel Prize isn't going to happen to everyone, you can't make one happen, it sort of happens to you. But when I arrived at the ANU in 1994, at the very end of 1994, I had a dream which was to measure the ultimate fate of the universe. Now that was, that was an aspirational thing to go out and try to measure when you're 27, but it seemed to me that uh, you always have to think big, you have to think about doing problems that you can explain to your family so that they can appreciate what you do when you're gone. And that is something I've always taken with everything I've done. So I've always tried to work out problems that I think I can explain to people. And almost any problem is explainable to your family if you think about it long enough. And you need to always think of it that way. But life, for me, has not been, um, as some people might think, just, you know, absolutely step-by-step step going to be uh, reaching this point. I had a fairly normal childhood. Many of you will realize that I grew up in the northern part of the United States, state of Montana, and then I moved to Alaska. I went to a public school. I did well in school, but, you know, I wasn't considered to be the class genius. I uh, did many things. I did sports, played in band. My biology teacher, when I told him I was going off to study astronomy because I didn't know what else to do with my life, and I'd figure it out once I got to university, said, oh, Brian, you know, we've had many students go off to physics, and we really think this is a bad idea because, you know, you're not the best student. <laughs> and uh, maybe you should think about doing something else. And it's not that we don't think you should do this. It's just that, you know, we don't want to see you uh, to fail. So <laughs> I thought about that and said, well, okay, maybe I'll fail. I, I don't care. I don't mind failing. And so one of the things I've always taken in life is you try things. You aren't a fail, uh, afraid to fail, and I fail all the time. But you move on because failing is part of trying. And so I've had, you know, the world is actually quite tolerant to failure, it turns out. And so you just go forth and uh, try your best at things. Ask stupid questions. It's one of the things I am worried about all of this is I ask a lot of stupid questions. And I don't think Nobel Prize winners are allowed to ask stupid questions. <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm going to do about this. But anyway, I put up with my stupid, stupid questions in the future. So coming to the ANU, uh, the block grant is something that I think we take for granted. But it is an extremely important thing. And it's one of the things that when I saw Minister Carr and the Prime Minister earlier in the week, as I mentioned, he said, you know, I got here at 27. I didn't have to apply for an ARC grant to get here. That took a year and a half to sort out, because the world would pass me by if that had happened. The Bob Grant and the ANU allowed me to work independently, supported my research, someone who's very young, to run an international team. And that is something that is uniquely Australian, to be able to do that. And it's something that I want to make sure that we enshrine here in the ANU for the future. We need to make sure that we are the Australian National University, that we are different than the rest of Australia. Because it is a great thing for Australia, it's a great thing for the people of this institution. But it does bring along some obligations. It's a, it's a status that we have here where we're expected to go out and take risks and do great things. And we're expected to share what we do here at the university with our colleagues around the country. Where it's not us versus them, it really is us helping our colleagues around the country. And so I've always tried to do that, and I know many of you have too. And sometimes we do feel like we're in a competition with these other institutions, but we're not. We're really here to do great things and to bring them along with us. So, as I look back at my career here, um, my first three years, I had a three-year position, where um, my first son, Kieran, here at the end, is looking very uncomfortable, was uh, very, very young. So I worked very, very hard, and I probably worked even harder than I needed to. And that's one of the things we as academics often do. 
It's very easy to throw your life out of balance. And doing well in academia is no longer about working harder than anyone else. It's no longer about being smarter than everyone else. It's about putting together teams, putting together thoughts from many, many disparate places, putting them together, working with people to get more done than you can do as a single person. And that requires a certain balance to life, which I think many of us forget about. So, um, balance is something that I've managed to be better on in the last few years, although my life does pull me around the world a fair bit. And it's not something that hinders you. Those of you who have children, you know, you don't have to worry about not putting in 80 hour weeks like some of your colleagues. The balance is actually as useful for success as the hard work. And so I think that's something I've learned here and something that Australia does very well compared to, for example, um, my homeland in the United States where people really do uh, put many, many more hours in and not necessarily useful hours in uh, to work all the time. And so it's something we can be proud of. But I think you should also know that in academia, we have great jobs. Now, we're not paid as much as the CEO of you know, Telstra or uh, Qantas, but we have so much better jobs than they have. And so, with that, we have to realize that these jobs are not easy. Our career structures are, frankly, terrible. But that's because we have these great jobs, and we learn to do things that, um, quite frankly, are useful in no matter what we do. In other jobs. I don't think, I've never met an astrophysicist yet who's unemployed. They all get jobs. And if they have to leave astronomy because it just doesn't work out for them, they typically make more money than they would as an astronomer. But they really don't have as good a job as we do have as astronomers. And so I think that risk and that pain that we have here in, a, in, in an academic environment is worth it. Because ultimately, if things don't work out and we take risks, and we do these great things of advancing human knowledge, we can fall back to a normal job, and we'll be really, really good at it. So in my case, the end of 1997, my job, I was finishing my three-year um, job here at the ANU, and it really looked like I wasn't going to get a job to continue on. And OK, I probably wouldn't have won the Nobel Prize, but I would have been happy, and I would have done well. And the universe would have marched on. The Nobel, uh, the Nobel Prize probably would have gone to Saul Rowland <laughs> on his own, which would have been, I guess, at this point, we were in a very tense competition. That would have been, I think, a terrible thing, at least for the emotion. <laughs> uh, it would have been okay. The, but the, the lesson there is, is that it was only at the last minute that uh, I did end up getting a job that allowed me to continue on my work here. And so I, those of you who are out there in your career structure wondering what the future is, don't worry about it. Do good work, do your best, and know that you're going to be able to do something good no matter what happens. And you just have to take that risk and to push forward. The university is a very competitive place. They can't just hand out billions of jobs to everyone because we would become a very large place because it's such a good place to work. And that's sort of the nature. So I think in um, looking at the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Prize is really to my mind, the celebration of science and the type of work that we do here at the university. We advance human knowledge. A lot of people want to know, how is this going to change my life? And the answer is, well, it's nice to know that you're a tiny speck on um, uh, what's in the universe. 75% of the universe is stuff that we don't understand. Another 23% is stuff we don't understand very well. And then the 4.5% that we're made out of, well, you know, that is the part of the universe we are. We're a small part. So it's quite philosophical work. But the work we do here at the fundamental level is the foundation for everything that we know in technology. Technology is built on this fundamental work. And so, you know, dark energy may be a dead end in the long term, or it may not be. It may be like quantum mechanics and lead to new understandings of physical models that do allow us to make computers or something new in the future. We don't know. But that's the way knowledge is. Knowledge is not a bad thing. It's only if it's used in a way that's not ethical that it can be used bad. That knowledge itself is empowering and is the future of humanity. We should be proud to be part of that here. Here at the ANU, we have great opportunity to do great things in the future. This is a 
in an environment where I came here from Harvard in 1994, and it was not a step down. Mount Stromo was one of the great institutions of the world, and it still is. And so I think it's always easy to think, ah, oh, we have almost more money and stuff in the United States or in Europe. Eh, maybe. The Accelerated Universe was done with about $25,000 of money over four years. So <laughs> what it had was my time, my full thought. That is what's valuable. You realize that time is what is valuable. Money, yeah, pretty big discount on that. It's worth a bit, but eh, not worth that much. <laughs> so when you look around, I hope that uh, people here, who are probably ready to pass out from the uh, being squished together, uh, can take solace that your life is probably not that dissimilar to what mine was five or 10 or 15 years ago. That really a Nobel Prize is there and waiting for anyone. It does require you know, a, bit of, uh, a bit of work on your part. It does require some luck, but who knows, it could happen to you. So, as I finish up, I think you uh, understand that, you know, my work has been a team effort, and so I guess I want to acknowledge my 19 other team members, one of whom, Adam Reese, has received the Nobel Prize with me, but I really have this group of people who allowed me, there were senior people, who allowed me at the age of 27 to be the leader of our team. And so, the team was founded with Nick Sunset, who is an American astronomer in Texas now, uh, and he, when I was 27, said, you take the team. You're the one who's got the time. You make, you run with it. And so, since then, I've been able to do that. And that teamwork has allowed us to succeed. Um, and the teamwork extends all the way, as has been uh, mentioned to my family, who I'll acknowledge now. So I'd like you guys to stand up. <laughs>